Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're listening to this, um, especially for those of you. I know that we have a couple of people that have moved back with family that are um, hours away, if not many, many hours away um, in different time zones. We're moving right into our next chapter here. We're going to be talking about chapter five for two classes. And in some ways, this is a little bit of a break, um, but it doesn't mean that you should slack off. This is going to be one of the easier chapters for some, although there are a few people that find this sort of technical information uh, more challenging. So um, hopefully you know yourself and you can decide which category you fall into. So for the methods, then um, what do you need to know? Um, well, the most important thing is we're thinking about these methods is allowing you to look forward. And think about how these methods might apply to all the different topics that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the semester. So for example, um, we may you know, be talking about learning and memory or the visual system or things like that. And we're going to be talking a lot about what cells are there and how they communicate with one another. And what that really turns into from the method side is this idea of asking how a method can answer a question. You know, what can this method tell us would be another way to think about this. Um, so in knowing you know, what questions the method answers or what it tells us about the brain, its structure, its function, and then also what it doesn't tell us is, is important. Um, so in some cases, that can be the trickiest part for people is, well, what, you know, what does this not tell us or what are the limitations? And I guarantee you, as we talk about some limitations or there are some described in the book um, that you, you should pay attention to those because um, in some cases these are going to be those higher level questions as well why why does this experiment maybe not work or what you know what was the reason for this and uh, you know so I think a lot of people feel better for this chapter after reading the book and having a lecture um, especially you know more than others then the other thing that we're going to talk about a little bit is whether the method can be used in humans or animals or both. And in some cases, we have complementary methods. And that's another thing that I personally will emphasize throughout this chapter um, is, is the idea that sometimes we have slightly different variations on a technique that we can use in both humans and animals to answer a question. So how do we attribute a function to a certain part of the brain. That's something that we're going to be talking about for the entire remainder of the semester. One of the ways that we do this um, goes back to something that we hinted at and started to highlight uh, in, in the second lecture where we talked about just the history of physiological psychology and neuroscience. Um, and one of the things that we talked about quite a bit in there, but not a, about every single example, were brain lesions. So the pioneering study of this was done by Pierre Florenz. And Florenz we did talk about because he was the first to use this experimental method of making localized damage or lesions to the brain. And this brought us to the very important idea of locationalism or functionalism. Um, the idea that specific parts of the brain are responsible for specific functions. Because the, the contribution of Florenz was, was being able to demonstrate to all of us that the brain indeed had some kind of division, that if you create a lesion in visual cortex, that you were going to generate some kind of a deficit in vision or in the auditory cortex with hearing um, and so on and so forth. And this is something that um, has informed much of what we know about what the brain does um, and how it does it. I think the last and kind of most important thing to know here is that we've spent so much time working with brain lesions that now we've not only affirmed the fact that this works, but um, we've been able to target more precise um, areas of the brain and had smaller and smaller targeting lead to more um, understanding of very specific functions. And just so that we have the textbook definition laid out at least once, um, a lesion is just a wound or injury to the brain. And this can happen in two forms, of course. It can be something, as we're talking about here, that happens experimentally, but it can also happen uh, naturally. It can be an injury to someone's brain that allows us to learn more about it. 
And in fact, we talked a little bit about this um, and we talked about some famous cases, but I want to point out some of these very, very famous cases, some of which we talked about and others we didn't, um, because they'll, they're considered critical case studies in psychology. And the first is patient HM. Um, and patient HM was actually known as HM only um, until uh, I was in graduate school. Um, um, and during this time, um, patient HM, who is an incredibly famous case study in psychology, uh, finally died um, and his name was revealed. Um, and there's still a lot of controversy um, regarding the his brain tissue um, because he was institutionalized for many, many years. Um, and you can actually find a, a video of um, the brain being sectioned and them determining the extent of damage. Uh, but HM was an interesting case because he had epilepsy. And the idea was that he had a surgery that was supposed to fix this. Um, and what we think from brain scans, and a, there's been a little bit of work done with the the brain itself to examine the tissue damage um, is that the surgery affected um, many different portions of his brain, the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, um, which are now thought of as being very important for learning and memory, um, as we're going to talk about in just a couple of chapters from now. Um, and then also um, the piriform cortex and amygdala, um, which are thought to be involved in other processes in the brain. Um, and I, I always hate to generalize what a process is, but um, any area of the brain has multiple functions, but we, we often think of them as being kind of famous for one thing. And so we think of the amygdala as being famous for um, emotional learning. Um, and the piriform cortex has some very interesting roles, including some things like smell um, processing, um, and it also is a big input to the amygdala. So all of these things are bundled in a very similar part of the brain. Um, and most of the damage was done to the hippocampus and, and um, it's input region or primary kind of input in the entorhinal cortex. The most interesting thing that makes HM this really famous case study is that he developed this kind of quirk after the surgery where he was unable to form new memories. So that that's kind of interesting because it, it tells us if we start thinking about this functionalism what that meant to have the loss of these areas of, of especially of the, the hippocampus but also this entorhinal cortex. And so HM could remember many things that had happened before in his life, um, you know, memories from childhood and all kinds of things like that from before the surgery. Um, but he was unable to specifically form new memories. And when we talk about learning and memory, we're, we're going to really put this to the test um, because in some ways, the general idea of unable to form new memories is not quite correct, um, but he was unable to form a specific kind of new memory. So as I said, um, at a point when I was in graduate school in 2008, um, we finally did get to see the entire extent of these um, lesions. And that's started to give us a little bit more of an understanding. And in some ways, there were not surprises because brain scans had been done. And we knew that there was damage to hippocampus or, hippo or areas near hippocampus. And in other ways, there were a few surprises when we got down to the specific anatomy, and we'll talk about this um, in over the next couple of lectures, that um, brain scans are not perfect. Um, so in some ways, in actually being able to see what we would call the gross anatomy, we learned more about the structures affected and how that might have affected HM. LeBorn was another that we talked about. Um, who had um, a specific form of aphasia, um, and he suffered from this incredible inability to speak for, for 20 years. And he was the one um, who finally um, was cared for by Paul Broca. And so you've probably all heard of Broca's area of the brain. And if not, now you know there's a, an area of the brain named after Paul Broca. Um, because when he um, met with LeBorn, he, he treated him and then a, um, very shortly thereafter, um, LeBorn died, not related to Broca's care, at least I don't think so. Um, and so he found this very specific lesion of the left frontal lobe. And you can actually um, see a picture of a lesion of Broca's area here, um, showing kind of what that would look like. Um, and one of the things you can see is that it's a, you know, kind of a fairly superficial uh, place. So it's an area that would be easy to have damaged. Um, and started to teach us about 
speech. Um, you know, we started to learn more about speech formation and exactly the, the process of being able to produce speech. And of course, we have the uh, counterpart area, Wernicke's or Wernicke's area, um, that um, goes along with this and create can create the the other form of aphasia. Going along through these case studies, another incredibly famous one is Phineas Gage. Um, so for those of you that don't know this story um, or, or all of these stories, I would be surprised. Um, they, they tend to come up very often in psychology, um, you know, intro to psych courses and things like that. Phineas Gage was a, a foreman on the railroad. And one of the things that they do when they're about to um, blast a hole in rock or, or things like that is that they put powder down into a hole and then they have these tamping rods that they're supposed to um, use to pack the powder down um, to, of course, make it um, create a, a much better explosion. Um, and usually there's some padding in between, you know, the tamping and the gunpowder and all these kind of things. And Phineas Gage, uh, you know, might have missed a step or two. Mistakes were made uh, and he created a spark. Um, that ignited the gunpowder and shot the tamping rod straight through his brain. Um, and he got lucky in a lot of different ways. Um, for one of the reasons that he got lucky is the high velocity. Um, we actually have a lot of different ways that we work with the brain now. And we know that things that are passing through at a very high velocity uh, tend to create less damage. Um, and of course, another reason that he got lucky is that um, the way that this went through the brain um, was, probably in an area that wasn't critical for some sort of vital function. So no matter the case, this tamping rod created damage to the brain and it, it created damage in what we think of as the left frontal lobe and an area we, we now know to be part of kind of the prefrontal cortex um, or at least the frontal cortex um, to put it more broadly. The most important thing related back to functionalism though is that gauge ended up with very profound changes in his personality. So even though he didn't have any deficits in many of these other things, and if you if you actually think about the last picture we looked at and you compare it to this one, then one of the things that you probably notice is that Broca's area is kind of somewhere right over here. So we're not even too far away from that. And yet with this very different form of damage, um, Phineas Gage ended up with very different deficits in function. So the most important thing to walk away from with all of this is that we, we do in fact have many examples of how very specific damage um, can, can cause a change in the brain. And some of these comes from these very famous case studies. Um, but in other cases, we, we see this experimentally. And so the process of doing this, we call experimental ablation. Um, and this involves purposefully destroying the part of a brain um, and of course, this is in animal studies. And then what we, we do is that we observe the changes in behavior that follow the loss of that area. So we damage part of a brain and then we observe what functions can still be done and also those that cannot be done. And we call these studies, if you carry them out kind of in a systematic way, right? Experimental ablation is the process of destroying the brain and the studies we call lesion studies. Um, so in, in this case, we have some experimenter come in and there are many different ways that we can create a lesion of the brain. We'll talk about a few of those. Um, and in, in lesion studies in, in animals, we're looking at what the behavioral change is, but we also, as you've now seen, um, often have these things in humans where we look at what the lesion looks like and we um, will look at these naturally occurring lesions, which can happen due to uh, accidents like car accidents or strokes um, or all kinds of other things that, that can create damage to the brain, um, degradation in aging. Um, and those are also considered to be a part of lesion studies. In fact, people are still to this day using the skull of Phineas Gage to create mathematical models of exactly what the damage might have been because we don't have a we don't have Phineas Gage's brain. All we have is his skull. And so we have estimations of what the damage would have been. So again, the most important thing here is that we learn about the behaviors that can no longer be performed. All right, this is, this is the most important thing. So you damage and you look for deficits. There are quite a few limitations to this approach, and that's a little bit of 
the way that we're going to approach this. So what's what what should this be able to tell us and what are the limitations? And that's what you should walk away with. It turns out for lesion studies that the very most important thing is the kind of lesion that we use. And we've gotten better at this over time. The earliest lesions were called radio frequency lesions. And these radio frequency lesions pass electrical current uh, in order to create heat and um, then a hole in the brain. The major advantage is that these are really effective and they were some of the earliest lesions. So they were something we knew we could do early on and pretty much from the point that we started working with electricity, we knew that electricity could damage tissue. Um, and in some ways, another big advantage of these is that um, this big degradation of tissue is incredibly similar to what might happen in some sort of trauma. So um, if you had um, a gunshot wound to the brain, then you would, you would potentially um, have an entire missing piece of tissue depending on exactly what happened and how. And so this damage is um, viable in some ways for understanding what's going on in the brain. The big disadvantage that we've now learned about is it's not an understanding what deficit this this trauma to the brain would cause in an area, uh, but it's not exactly the best for functionalism because what happens with radio frequency lesions, which would also happen in, in some forms of trauma, is that the the axons passing through that area are also damaged. And so what we mean by this is that um, if we if we look at a connection, um, and let's say we have a connection between areas A and C. Uh, but it happens to pass through area B. Then what that means is that, you know, I have my cell bodies or soma in area A, the axons pass through B, and then I would have my terminals or, or terminal buttons in, um, in area C here. So if I create a radio frequency lesion, then I should be able to understand what's going on in this connection. Um, and if I, if I create the damage in area A, I can examine that function there. However, Another thing that could happen is I could think that the function is attributed to area B because of this disadvantage where affecting the axons in the area uh, in area B are really the ones coming from A to C. And so I could create damage in the middle here and just basically cut off the connection. Um, so this would this would kind of be the you know equivalent of uh, you thinking that your cable wasn't working just because some guy digging down the street cut through the line and you could sit there and, and start playing with your cable box for hours on end and trying to turn it on and off and resetting it when really there's nothing that you can do because the, the connection um, going out of that box is has been severed. Um, so you might go back to the cable company and say, hey, you guys gave me a dud box. And they're going to say, well, no, we didn't. This is working just fine. Um, so it, you can misattribute function in this way. For this reason, we moved on to better lesions. And so the next um, lesion type that became very prominent, and this is um, quite a bit more recent, are called excitotoxic lesions. So you remember, although it was a very subtle point, that one of the jobs of glial cells is to help um, take up neurotransmitter um, to prevent it from lingering too long. And a reason for this is that certain neurotransmitters, especially those that activate neurons, can be uh, damaging, um, if not lethal, to the neurons. And we saw we call this excitotoxicity. So the way I like to have you think about this is if, if you know the story of the original marathon runner, right? You know, this 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 guy needs to run and warn of a, a, a coming army and he runs this incredibly long distance and, you know, he, he delivers the message only to, to you know, die on the steps, right? Um, so you've expended all the energy of a cell because you've used up everything that it has um, and then and then it dies. And so this can happen. And in some ways we think maybe some neurodegeneration might happen due to things like this, an inability to perfectly control or regulate the activity of the brain. But we can also create this um, basically by giving chemicals that cause this overactivation. And so you can see a, a picture of the hippocampus here, um, and we have all of these cell layers. So you can see the cell layer here, and then we give this excitotoxic lesion, and you can actually see that all of the cells in between the two arrows are killed by giving this chemical that excites them to death. 
The big advantage to this, um, as compared especially to radio frequency lesions, is that it destroys the cell bodies um, because it, that's where this excitation happens. Um, but it spares any of the fibers that are passing through. And some of these studies in, in the hippocampus were among the earlier ones to verify this because we know those connections uh, very, very well. A disadvantage here um, that's also a disadvantage of the radio frequency lesions is that, that it's not reversible. Uh, so one of the things that can become very important for functionalism, at least in modern functionalism, is to show that you lose that function and then you can also recover it. Um, and this helps to prove that, um, in fact, just the area of interest um, is the area that um, you can ascribe that function to. There are some other approaches that we use also to help then prove in, in kind of more modern neuroscience that um, either these radio frequency lesions that have been done historically or the, these excited toxic lesions um, still hold true. One of the things that's more common now than perhaps used to be are uh, experiments that use sham lesions. Um, so in this case, this is a control because when we go in to do an injection into the brain, you can imagine if, if we're injecting these excited toxic chemicals into a mouse or a rat, for example, uh, then we have to do a brain surgery. We have to open um, up a small hole in the skull and you have to put a needle down and all of that can create its own kind of damage. So one of the things that we do is we go inject uh, something else, maybe like cerebrospinal fluid um, that would already be flushing through many parts of the brain or saline, um, or we just open up the, the skull and do the surgery to prove that it's not just the act of doing all of that stuff that's kind of invasive, uh, that's causing some sort of a problem with function. Another thing that we've um, since developed are, are what we call reversible lesions. And really these um, involve a cocktail of drugs. The most common is baclofen and mucimol. And, and what these two drugs do together is that they shut down the activity of the brain and they can do this for very long periods of time. So in a way, it's the same as the excitotoxic lesion where the cells are no longer able to function and it doesn't affect fibers of passage. Um, however, the drugs eventually metabolize out of the system and the function comes back. Um, and in that way, we can see what happens um, for short periods of time. And actually, this has been a very important pro approach for experiments on memory because then you can block, let's say, memory uh, formation by um, giving this at a very specific uh, period of time, um, but then you can you can see that other memory recall um, later on is, is maintained or something like that. And then the last thing is that we've improved our ability um, to do all of these um, by very specific genetically targeted approaches. So what we have now are um, systems. Um, if, if you haven't heard anything about CRISPR-Cas9 and ways that we can get very specific targeting, um, this is one of these things that's likely to win a Nobel Prize um, in your generation. Uh, but we, we can now target cells in very specific ways, and we've been doing this in, in animals for a long time by creating um, animal lines that allow us to use kind of lock and key systems. Um, and then we also have things that we can we can induce in these cells, and one of them is that we can trigger um, the normal uh, apoptosis or cell death in, in a specific class of cells by causing them to produce um, caspase, which is an enzyme that um, or a protein that, that triggers this cell death. Uh, so we can kill only a certain type of cell. Maybe we can kill only dopamine neurons or only serotonin neurons or something like that. And we can determine how not just lesioning an entire area of the brain is or the axons and that entire area of the brain, we now get down to finer and finer um, resolution in, in the exact way that we are shutting down or killing neurons in the brain. So a good question that you should be asking after me talking about all of these different um, ideas of, hey, we, we get into a mouse's brain and we have to do this whole surgery. It's just how do, how do we even do this kind of thing? How do we target and how do we do these things very specifically? And the process here is called stereotaxic surgery. So 
Um, basically, this is a surgery in the brain, and the surgery that the or the approach I should say that we use in a mouse or a rat is exactly the same um, as the approach that ends up being used in the human, because the process of stereotaxic is just uh, the our a, a process where we can locate an object in space. Um, so the way that we do this in neuroscience is that we take advantage of the way that the skull forms together. And it turns out that for almost all of us, this is a very common approach. And modern um, human neuroscience also couples this with imaging that we'll talk about um, to get a better idea of, of what's happening. So you may or may not know um, that when, when you're born, you have separate plates of your skull. Um, and they um, form together over time and they grow together. So um, if you happen to have, let's say, like a young infant around the house, um, you can you can do um, a very gentle experiment. But if you're around a baby, you can actually feel some of these like kind of empty spots where if you go feel kind of towards the top and in front of the head and, and maybe towards the back, that's a little less common. Um, you can feel kind of a little dimple spot. Um, don't press down too hard. I don't want you pressing any baby brains this week. Uh, but you can you can go and you can kind of feel this this spot that, that where the skull has not completely formed back together yet. Um, and you'll be able to do that and maybe some phrenology at the same time. So we use this, the fact that these bones grow together and they grow together in a very specific way um, that's kind of programmed by the body um, to create a set of landmarks, right? It's, it, it's as if we have crossroads over the top of the skull that we can use to determine where to go. And these, um, these sutures or connections in the bone um, come together at fairly reliable locations over and over and over again. And they give us a general idea of kind of the, the X, Y, and Z coordinates that we would care about for targeting a part of the brain. So you can think about the top of the skull exactly like that as some sort of a coordinate plane where um, in this case, we would normally be looking at this from the other direction. So the X um, would be kind of the left or right of the body. The Y would be the front to the back of the skull. And the Z is, of course, the depth down into the skull from the point of maybe, let's say, touching the skull. And we combine this with a with either imaging in the humans um, or a stereotaxic atlas in, in animals. And, and in humans, we're also combining with an atlas just a little bit differently. Um, that allow us to understand where specific structures are in kind of the X, Y, or Z plane. So now we're looking at the brain as if you were looking straight at somebody's face. So you could imagine almost like these are, you know, eyes and a mouth, something like that. It kind of almost looks like a face here. Um, so this is as if we've taken cuts, you know, starting from the front of the eye and going from the top of the head down to the chin and doing that over and over again and basically just making cheese slices from the front to the back of the brain. So what you can see here is that we have a lot of different structures that we can identify and we could we could also cut in different planes if we wanted to. But all of this ends up relying on this same coordinate system that I just showed you where the X is this would be the, the center kind of the middle of the skull um, and this would be that X plane kind of going left to right. Um, and then of course the cheese slices are going from front to back. So those would be our Y and you can't see the different cheese slices here, but each new slice towards the back of the brain um, would be a new position in the Y. And then Z in this case, we're actually seeing, which is the depth. So the top of the skull would be here. Um, and then if you were to inject down, you would go down, 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 down to your target. So the apparatuses that we have, of course, um, are always changing a little bit, but they all work off of the, the same basic principle, um, even in humans, which is that we fix something um, to the head or fix the head to an apparatus uh, that then allows us to um, find where our landmarks are, right? So we can we can figure out where the, the sutures in the skull are. Um, the front one is called bregma and the back one is called lambda. And then we can we can develop a coordinate system based on that and then we can move relative to that system with very fine precision. So it usually involves um, something in, in this case, it looks a little bit like a protractor combined with some rulers, but you can move um, exactly, you know, uh, 
4.2 millimeters to the left and 3.5 millimeters forward, and then you can drop down uh, to to your area of interest. Um, and in the human, of course, being able to do this in more of an orbital way where you can go around the entire skull um, is very important. So this is the way that we can achieve kind of precision targeting. And again, in, in humans, in many cases, this is assisted by imaging um, both uh, sometimes CT, X-ray, um, or even in certain cases, fMRI um, or MRI ahead of time um, to give some idea of kind of the exact structure, function, location, and so on and so forth. Moving on to something that's a little bit different of an idea, but it's equally important for things like the functionalism or locationalism um, that we've been talking about is the process of brain histology. So if I were an experimenter and I went through and I, I had completed an entire lesion study, um, then something that's incredibly important is, you know, I might use the stereotaxic apparatus, but the problem with the stereotaxic apparatus is that it's an average, right? I said the, the skull plates grow together pretty consistently, but notice I didn't say this is a precise and accurate way of targeting the brain. It is precise and it is accurate, but it is not perfect. And this is where histology comes in. So when you get to the slides, I would I would highly encourage you to go watch just a few minutes of this YouTube video that is actually some of the um, footage of the sectioning from HM's brain. But this is, remember I told you, we, we got to the point where HM finally passed away um, and we learned that Henry Malaison um, was this famous case for all of this period of time. And um, so there was an immediate effort to try and study what had happened to create the very specific memory deficits that he showed. And the way that they, they do this, um, which you can see is, this is actually kind of that cheese slice view of the brain again from front to back, is, is to do um, sectioning of the brain and to perform, um, in many cases, some sort of uh, testing or examination of exactly what happened within the brain tissue. And so this is um, you know, one look at how this might be done in a big human brain. This is a huge uh, frozen block um, containing brain tissue. So the brain is like any other tissue. And in fact, if anything, it's softer. Um, so if we want to work with brain tissue, we, we have to be able to um, treat it very carefully in order to look at what might be happening. This can happen through a process of fixation. So um, a chemical, usually formalin or, or formaldehyde, if you've ever worked in um, a lab where you've done anatomy, like if you've done uh, frog dissection or anything like that, um, then you've probably used a variation of one of these chemicals or um, you know, maybe this is a morbid view of it, but if you've ever been to a, a open casket funeral, you know, we, we use some similar chemicals for embalming humans in the modern era. Um, so the idea is that fixation um, creates some sort of a cross link between all of the different things inside of tissue. So the proteins and other things, and it basically preserves their structure by kind of binding them together. This is just like a super glue for your inner parts. Uh, and the other thing that we can do is freezing. Um, so we can preserve tissue by storing it at incredibly cold temperatures. Um, and this also for something like the brain. Um, when it's cold, as, as you, know, you know, things as they get colder, they become more and more rigid. So if you ever try and uh, serve an ice cream cake at somebody's birthday and you take a knife and try and cut through it, it's pretty hard to do for a few minutes. Um, usually it ends up with somebody in the family breaking the knife, and I'm certain you've all been there. So if we want to keep this very finicky brain tissue rigid, we can we can freeze it. And that will also help us to be able to process it. And in the picture I showed you on the last side, that brain was clearly frozen um, in a giant block. What this allows us to do is a process called sectioning. So there are different tools depending on exactly what you need to do, but they all kind of look um, a little something like these two, um, where there's usually some sort of a, a motor or a wheel and a blade. In this case, the, the blade is inside of this big machine called the cryostat that um, is kind of like a walk-in uh, freezer. Um, 
where the brain would be inside and inside would be something very similar to this where you have the brain on a block and you have a blade that passes over it um, and then it it moves down um, a little lower in a very precision way so it might cut through you know a millimeter and then it drops down and cuts another millimeter and another millimeter if we were doing something like human brain um, in a mouse or a rat that this could be even smaller than that it could be on the order of, of you know even five microns um, teeny teeny tiny segments of the brain um, being cut at one time and so that's part of the main point is that it's precision cutting of the brain um, and it can be either um, cold um, or um, in some cases, um, it doesn't have to be cold, but the machinery is all very simple. And then the last thing that this allows us to do is once the brain is processed, um, there are some different ways that we would get this onto a slide and, and kind of do the intermediate processing depending on whether it started out frozen or started out fixed, um, but we can, we can stain the brain. So staining is one of the ways that we've been able to differentiate parts of the brain. It's one of the ways we've been able to create brain atlases to know where to target uh, because there are there's form and structure to the brain. If you were to look at a piece of tissue, um, in fact, if you look at the one that was on that frozen um, frozen block just a few slides back, um, what you will see is that the brain tissue looks mostly uniform. And somebody that's been working with the brain for a long time might start to see some subtle differences between white and gray matter or areas where they're, they're, uh, that are dense with cells or areas that are dense with axons. Um, however, there, you can't see all of the specific details. So if we apply stains, then we're able to do a better job of that. Um, and in the case here, you can see a stain that's really commonly used just as a broad kind of stain called Cresso Violet. Um, and already we start to see the brain take more shape. This is how in that excitotoxic lesion image I showed, you could see that the cells were present in this big um, kind of group layer of hippocampus, which is barely present here. You start to see different nuclei of the brain that are separated from one another. Um, and again, you can see kind of white and gray matter um, but you can also start to see the brain take more form. There are a variety of different things that we can stain for. Um, so one of these is uh, we have a lot of generic stains and a very commonly used one is called a nissel stain, which stains for really anything that has a nucleus. Um, and so this would, um, stain for pretty much everything in the brain. It's just giving the brain color, but of course places where there's more density of nuclei, where like where there's more cells compared to a place where there's not, like a lot of axons, we would see a difference. There are also some stains that can be very specific to some kind of a target. So we have uh, neuron specific stains um, that can use to differentiate neurons from glia, for example. A third thing that we can do is to target um, specific proteins that are produced by the brain. And the way that we do this is through the use of antibodies. Um, so these antibodies are exactly like the ones that um, a lot of us have been thinking about recently as we're very in tune with the idea of, of uh, diseases and, and protection from them and things like that. Um, but we can actually design and develop them to target um, any protein. And, and so that's exactly what happens is that you have some um, people that fabricate antibodies that can target and then it be used to stain um, certain things in the brain. And if uh, there's a certain protein that differentiates one neuron from another, for example, only um, dopamine neurons have the protein called tyrosine hydroxylase that's used to synthesize dopamine, then we could create an antibody to target that tyrosine hydroxylase and we would be able to identify dopamine neurons in the brain. And then the last thing we can do is to go a step deeper than that. And of course we know that we have, or you should all know at least from the last chapter in the quiz that we have um, basically DNA that's transcribed to mRNA and then translated into protein. Um, so, you know, the antibodies look at the protein, but we can also look at um, the mRNA or the DNA, the, the deeper steps in that process um, through a process called in situ hybridization where we use something that's kind of like the antibody. Um, instead, it's a complementary sequence of DNA or mRNA that can bind to some sequence that we find um, in a certain cell and we can target those. 
and we can label cells that express the mRNA that would be used to produce, let's say, again, this tyrosine hydroxylase um, protein. And then the last thing that we need to be able to do is to be able to image these brains. And so the, the most important thing to pay attention to here is what these different imaging processes um, allow us to do. And the main difference is resolution. So the most zoomed in that we can go is an electron microscope. And this is what an image from an electron microscope looks at. And trust me, as of probably less than five years ago, I had, I had done nothing with an electron microscope ever in my life. Um, but uh, the way to think about this is um, we have a beam of electrons, of course, which are the, some of the, the tiniest things that, that we think about in terms of you know tangible objects in the world. And so electrons um, get passed through a teeny tiny spot of tissue, and then we, we determine exactly how well they get through. Um, and so in many ways, um, electron microscopy is like a very fancy game of shadow puppets, where things that are really dense block the electrons from going through, and they create a shadow, and things that are not very dense um, are not able to do that. And this is what has allowed, uh, this is the thing that has allowed us to resolve a lot of um, structure in uh, things that are very small in the nervous system. For example, um, you know, you might be wondering why people draw mitochondria in a very goofy way with all these kind of weird ridges and stuff like that. But you can see all of these different mitochondria. And sure enough, if you look, you can see these kind of ridge-like structures uh, that you've probably seen in biology textbooks for years and years and years. And also, um, I promised all of you that I would make certain to get a picture of what a synapse looks like. And of course, we usually see this big gap between two structures, but the place where the arrow points here um, is actually a synapse being made. And so you can see that there's a lot of proteins and things that help pass the neurotransmitter back and forth and probably receptors on the postsynaptic end um, that's getting, you know, receiving the message. But the synapse, you, you can't, I could make this picture as big as I want, you probably still would not see a gap between these two. Um, it doesn't look like you've seen it in your textbook. Um, and this is because these shadows that we create with the electrons are able to zoom in. Um, uh, and even the cheapest electron microscope in the world, which is not that cheap, um, would allow us to zoom in 10,000 times or more. And some of the, the better and newer electron microscopes can zoom in, you know, on the orders of hundreds of thousands of times um, in terms of what they can see. But of course, all they're really able to see are these shadows. And we can use antibodies with an electron microscope um, to make things, make certain things more dense and amplify how dense they are um, by adding more material to them. But it doesn't mean that we can resolve everything. So, the main reason for using an electron microscope is to zoom in incredibly far. So here is that bigger look, and as I promised, so I don't think that I think this gap here is really the gap between two cells. Um, but again, zooming in a little bit bigger, I don't think there's really much you can see in terms of a gap for a synapse. They're, the cells pretty much touch each other. The next method would be zooming out quite a bit. And so we have fluorescent or bright field microscopy. So if the electron microscope is 10,000 times zoom, then uh, fluorescent microscopes um, or microscopes doing bright field microscopy are down much further than that. Um, and this depends on kind of the resolution of light in some ways. So many, as you all know, or, or maybe should know, um, if you've taken a physics class, uh, pretty much every energy in the world has a wavelength. And we think about this as like, you know, like, well, does it have a, like a really slow squiggle or does it have a really fast squiggle? Uh, but the engineers of the world have to think about the fact that those slow squiggles and fast squiggles actually have a physical length to them. And there's some really important reasons that that matters when you're calculating, uh, you know, things for like the International Space Station, for example. Um, so in the case of these optics, we have a limit. And so for fluorescent or bright field microscopy, it's probably somewhere around 200 times magnification, right? So there's a big jump then, you know, we go from 
10,000 times magnification all the way down to 200 times. And it's enough to be able to see cells and to be able to get a pretty nice resolution of what's happening at a neuron. But um, if to, just to give you an idea, you know, if you look right above my um, my laser pointer here, that would be a point where a synapse is being made, right? We have some sort of a, a connection here or branching out um, is what it looks like. And, um, you know, this little local connection here, at the very least, would represent around the size of a synapse. And so we were looking at in just a piece of a synapse before, and now, you know, that's it's almost like the tiniest thing on here, right? So it's, we're talking a huge difference in what we can resolve. But the big advantage of these bright field and fluorescent microscopes is that we we can use them very well with stains. So um, you can see here we have three different um, stains happening all at the same time, um, one of which is staining something kind of in the nucleus is what it looks like. Um, and then, of course, we have a stain for the, the entirety of the cell itself, and it looks like something staining other cells nearby in the blue. Um, this is just some sort of a stock image, but we clearly are able to get uh, multiple different features here by using three different colors in the fluorescent mode. And even in bright field, we can usually get um, two colors, um, sometimes like a brown and a blue or a, or a purple or, or, um, or red and blue um, stains that we can see. A specific form of these is the one that, that can get up to those 200 times is called a confocal microscope. And it allows us to get really detailed scans. And pretty much all these images I'm showing you are from that um, uh, because it, it basically uses kind of out of focus light um, to be able to scan over in you know an X, Y, and Z plane by only um, shining its, its light to, to activate these fluorescent proteins in a very specific spot. Um, but again, you can see that it's able to resolve both incredible detail, um, even at this resolution. And again, you can also then resolve uh, multiple colors using a fluorescent microscope. Um, and the bright field images um, look like kind of the crystal violet one I showed you for the histological staining. You know, again, you can see the tissue, you can see its form and structure, and it just depends on uh, how zoomed in you are as to what you can resolve. So the last thing that we're going to talk about today is how we trace connections in the brain. And this will be a more general view um, in many ways. But you learned a little bit about this as you learned about axoplasmic trace. One of the first things that we need to talk about are the ways in which we can study connections. And if you think back to what we talked about for axoplasmic transport, uh, you'll recognize that we're going to have a little bit of overlap in the terminology. Most importantly, we can study connections that go from some area of the brain to somewhere else, and we call these efferent connections, and they follow in this anterograde direction. But we can also study which neurons connect to a given area of the brain, and we call these afferent connections, and these are the ones that are making synapses onto our area of interest. Um, and this kind of going against the direction of travel when we're label labeling would be in the retrograde direction. So the way that I like to tell people to remember this is that you need to keep the cells that we're studying. In this case, they're showing the ventromedial hypothalamus. But you, you need to keep the cells that you're studying as the center. So efferent connections are ones that exit those cells. So E for efferent, E for exit. Okay? Whereas the afferent connections are the ones that access those cells. So they're the ones that are that are making synapses onto this area or they are targeting this area. And so they're the ones making connections and gaining access to these neurons. Um, that's my memory mnemonic. Uh, if you have another one um, that you can think of or something like that, then you could use it in one of your multiple choice questions. So then making things very, very simple, if we want to perform tracing to see where axons go, we put a tracer at the cell body. 
um, or we put it at the area of the soma. In the, in the example before, we would put it at the ventromedial hypothalamus and it would label and the tracer would fill the axons. And you can see these almost like gold particles here. Uh, these are all axons from an anterograde <clears throat> tracer. So in this case, um, we're labeling terminal fibers. And if we had something like an electron microscope, we might even be able to zoom in and see these labeled. Um, they would have a darker shadow um, to show that they were more electron dense because of this tracer being present. Um, so in this case, we're figuring out where these connections go to. And this this is basically the point of this tracing. You could inject in one area of the brain and you could figure out all of the different places that its projections go out to, um, kind of like creating a web diagram inside the brain. Now you probably have imagined that the opposite of this then is retrograde labeling. So in this case, things work backwards. Um, I'm showing you a figure from one of my own papers here few years ago. Um, and in this case, we use the retrograde tracer floral gold, and we inject this into an area of the brain called the lateral habenula. So the, in the lateral habenula, the place that is picking up this tracer is not the cell body like in the anterograde direction, but it's actually out at the terminal fibers. And so you can see all these fibers have picked up this tracer, but the tracer um, gets transported by our retrograde axoplasmic transport back to the cell bodies. And then that protein ends up filling up the cell bodies so we can stain them and see where they are. So in a lot of ways, these tracing experiments are, are early, <clears throat> uh, kind of an early easy example for us of, of many of the things that we've talked about, right? We are trying to figure out parts of the brain and how they interact and connect to each other. Um, and in some ways, we've talked about lesion studies, um, you know, showing us what's connected and what's not by axons that pass through. Um, we've talked about microscopy and, and immunohistochemical staining. So in this case, we, um, we inject a tracer and then we use staining to figure out where the tracer was injected. We also use staining to figure out where all the um, retrogradely labeled neurons are. Um, and this gives us a full picture and the final piece of getting that literal picture besides doing all the processing of the brain tissue by cutting it um, is that we come into a microscope and we take a picture and in, in this case um, this is using a bright field microscope so it's a bright white light that's taking a picture of a stain that you can see by eye whereas the fluorescent stains we need special lamps uh, kind of like you could think of like a black light that makes things glow um, that's one example of, of the the idea um, to, to make certain colors glow one at a time. So um, in this case, what we discovered is that some of these inputs come from an area of the brain called the lateral preoptic area. Um, and that happens by putting all of these different pieces together. Um, and what this shows is that these neurons in the lateral preoptic area send their axons out to the lateral habenula. So we're tracing kind of in a backwards direction, but what we're really seeing is a connection of the preoptic area soma all the way out to their axon terminals in the lateral habenula. Um, so that's where we're just tracing the projection in the opposite direction to figure out where the inputs to the lateral habenula are. And there are many, many more. I'm just showing you one example here. So and again, this means that this is going in against the direction of the neuron. So if you were to go back to chapter two and just look at your picture of, of a neuron, this goes from the terminals and travels backwards to label cell bodies. Then the last thing we're gonna talk about today is how we do this um, in human brains. So we have a couple of different ways we can do this. One is computer, computerized tomography or a CT. The other is magnetic resonance imaging. And then the third is really a variation on MRI called diffusion tensor imaging. So a CT scan, um, some of you may have had this. We can use it in the brain, um, but it's basically beams of x-rays. And we use it almost like those stereotaxic atlases where you have something that takes slices using beams of x-rays so you can think of it as you know those cheese slices i was talking about before um, are being taken by you know beams of of, of x-rays and allowing us to get a picture of what's going on and they can detect um, areas that almost like the electron microscope that are more or less dense and that because we have density differences in parts of our body can give us a picture of what's going on 
Um, so this allows us to see things like tumors or brain bleeds, um, and it's a very great first look, but not a very detailed look. CT scans, though, are getting a whole lot better, um, and you know they're a very important early diagnostic tool for all kinds of things because uh, they're they're quick to mobilize, right? It doesn't take much to get somebody in for a CT scan. Um, so we can see, for example, in this scan number five, some sort of you know abnormalities in the brain um, that are very important for suggesting that a brain bleed is happening, and that can trigger an easy um, ability to treat somebody for a stroke. And you can see this this area here where there's kind of a change in the density. The next thing is magnetic resonance imaging, and this is kind of a not necessarily something you, you need to know all of the details about, but it would be good to have an idea of, of why this works differently. So the basic idea is that we have hydrogen atoms, mainly because we have a lot of water in the brain. And so, um, you know, we, we have all these hydrogen atoms that would normally be in a random position, but we use an incredibly strong magnet um, to align all of these atoms and kind of pull them in one direction. And then at the same time, we use a radio wave, so magnetic, and then radio wave for the resonance um, that gets passed through, and it basically causes the atoms to um, shift in one direction um, that depends on exactly how the, the wave is applied. And then we kind of watch them um, basically shift back as we release this radio wave and they bounce their energy off and we can read back that energy. So these atoms kind of return to normal and and yet we get this this image that bounces back. Um, in some ways you could think of this like a you know a, a single atom level sonar. So what the MRI machine is reading are all these radio waves that come back. Um, and this is also kind of like the CT scan, um, a measure of density, except for the fact that um, by having these, you know, really strong magnets, then we and and of course very sensitive um, sensors to to read these radio waves coming back, um, and also the ability to modulate the radio waves differently, you know, tune into different channels and other things like that as as is needed, um, then we we can see the differences in the way this is emitted and it gives us a much higher resolution scan of the brain. So very recently, probably um, you know, within the past couple of years, there was um, uh, the most high resolution scan of the human brain that had ever been taken. Um, and so I'm gonna show all of you a quick video of that you can see just what it looks like to pass through the brain here. So in, in this case, I forget if we're coming from the side or the top, it looks like the side from this portion, but the um, they actually did this over hundreds of hours. So this is not a living brain, it's actually a dead brain, but it's helping us to do things like get a better map of all the structures of an average brain. Yes, they're coming from the side. So back here, you can see the cerebellum, you'll see the brain stem, maybe a little piece of it coming in somewhere near the middle here. Um, and then you can see the ventricles where fluid passes through the brain. That's where those ependymal cells we learned about come from. Um, and they are kind of passing through from the, it looks like from the left to the right side of somebody's head. This would be the front. Um, this, this is where that Broca's area is. And Phineas Gage had damage kind of up near this area too. You can see the brain stem coming back out to the spinal cord here as we finally hit the middle of the brain. Um, and so you can see this kind of incredible just level of, of structure that we can resolve. Um, this is about, I think this was a, either 10 or 100 microns that they um, took this image at. So it's super high resolution. I mean, we're talking that each one of these slices you're seeing is a fraction of a millimeter. Um, and that's about as good a resolution as anyone could ask for. Um, usually, if we're imaging for looking at brain damage, it would be much less resolution than that. All right, home stretch here. So the other thing I want to talk about just quickly, because the brain covers it, is diffusion tensor imaging. And this is a way um, in kind of comparing human and animal techniques. Of course, we said if we want to do structure in a mouse, we would probably um, take sections of brain tissue and we can do this in humans post-mortem. Um, but if we want to look at you know pathways and things like that, we have this retrograde tracing or anterograde tracing, 
And what somebody discovered is that you can also do this in a living human with this diffusion tensor imaging. Um, so the basically this this is a variant of fMRI, like I said, that allows us to see different um, connections, you know, different fibers in the brain. And what this technique does is it takes advantage of the, the fact that water molecules like to move along some kind of path of least resistance, um, which in many cases is it causes differences in the way that they move along like fiber bundles in the brain, um, you know, these kind of lipid highways as compared to just moving within structures in the brain. And so if you take an fMRI or an MRI and you do um, some really kind of cool post-processing of, of just that same um, type of data that I showed you before, you you can actually get, um, or, or, you know, in some cases, maybe there's a scan difference, but um, but you can get an image of just where all of these kind of pathways and connections in the brain are. And, and so that's something that um, also falls into this kind of structural um, technique that we can use. So I think it's fairly, um, a fairly good idea for me to continue giving you some examples of just what a test question might look like um, for this type of material. Um, so what, an example of a, a question might be like what which scan could find the location of a lesion in a living brain. And so I want you to think about this for just a second, get your answer in your head. We have confocal microscopy, we have electroencephalogram, computer, computerized tomography or magnetic resonance imaging, um, or electron microscopy. So if you're thinking through these and you're a little bit stuck, um, then you know the first thing you have to do is think about where things would happen and we can eliminate the confocal microscopy and electron microscopy. Those happen in tissue that's been collected. So definitely not in a living brain. Um, and then we We'll talk more about EEG next class. Um, so this would probably be something that would be hard to eliminate until we go through recordings, um, but that's um, a way to record electrical activity. And so from what you learned today though, you should be able to zero in and say, I think computerized tomography, because we showed just a few slides ago that this was something we And sure enough, that's, that's where you land. Um, another good example would be, you know, to ask something like how could we, um, what's a technique that we could use in, in a non-living brain in both, you know, mice and humans or something like that? Um, or what's, or maybe what's a comparable technique for looking at pathways between, um, you know, in, in an animal versus in a human? Um, and you could think, you know, that diffusion tensor imaging and retrograde tracing are complementary methods, but one is more likely to be used in kind of a preclinical or an animal study, and the other is more likely to be used in, in humans to look at pathways. So those are some of the things you should be thinking about. And it goes back if you to that very, very first set of slides from this lecture. So you should go through that. You know, what can we use the technique for? What are its limitations? How does how does a preclinical model inform the human or how do we compare them those are kind of the main things that we need to understand because they inform us moving forward with that in mind that is the end elfine if you have questions you should absolutely show up to office hours we had um, about three people this past week which is great um but we're gonna there's certainly gonna be more questions you're also welcome for this week to show up um, and talk about the exam um, and my rule is that I'm not going to release too much information until the exam closes, um, which it is now closed. Um, so if you have any questions whatsoever, you can come talk about those. Um, and of course, as always, you can use the, the chat or the Canvas email or personal email. Um, I tend to prefer direct emails more than the Canvas ones just because I have to go through two steps to get to them. But whatever works for you works for me. Uh, okay, well, this has been a very long lecture. We're going to have a few more of these, but um, go take a walk and hang out for a little bit. Um, get away from just being at your computer for virtual classes, and I will see you next time.